Honorable members, excellencies, uh, Transparency International colleagues, heads of institutions that are with us, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it is great to be in Trinidad and I wish I could only stay longer, but it means maybe I'll be welcome back. First, I would like to convey congratulations and appreciation uh, for Transparency uh, Institute's work in preventing and tackling corruption here. Um, this chapter has been a constructive force uh, in this country and represents so well what the founder of Transparency International wanted to achieve way back. He had been at the World Bank and had seen the devastation of corruption. So he took an early retirement to start Transparency International uh, 24 years ago. And it was because he had witnessed the devastation of corruption, he decided he couldn't sit still. But the interesting part is that he was brilliant in how he set up Transparency International. This is 101 about Transparency International. Uh, what he really did, instead of just creating uh, an international body somewhere in the world, uh, what he did was to, first of all, say we need to be grounded nationally around the world. And that's where we have the national chapters. And without that, we'd be an international organization somewhere. But now we have international chapters in over 100 countries. That is what makes the difference. The other part, of course, that, that uh, they did at the time was to also uh, have individual members and advisory councils that could bring special expertise to the table and a secretariat uh, in Berlin. So the way that also they decided to work, which has been pretty well sustained, uh, is that on one hand, the Transparency International could speak out on issues where you needed to speak out, while at the same time being a constructive solutions provider. And that's not easy, necessarily, because people have different expectations of what an organization like this one can do. But I think that having the two made it possible for us to be the constructive force that I was uh, speaking about. The other part was that of saying, you know, we will need to have strategies, we'll need to have multi-year strategies, but at the same time, we will not have blinkers as emerging issues arise that we may not have foreseen two years ago, or as um, new opportunities come forward. And I think, you know, when, when you operate in this way, then um, you can really uh, move uh, and still be in the playing field where the action uh, is. And it's basically how corruption affects people and nations that has driven the work of Transparency International. And to remind us a bit about some of these issues, I would like to just share with you some of the, this impact um, by giving and then go to some examples of what Transparency International has been doing as a movement around the world. Of course, as we look at this issue, uh, every country is different. Corruption is in every country. However, some have less than others, and we need to learn from that as well, as I think uh, our, our High Commissioner was mentioning. But where corruption is prevalent, a number of things happen. One, the poor are doubly victimized. Because when bribes are asked for essential services, they will seldom ask that to people in power or who are powerful. They will do so, however, for the poor, where sometimes the services are barely available, but if on top of it, um, you have to pay a bribe in order to get access to health, to education, for licensing, then, of course, uh, you are doubly victimized. Uh, Transparency International does a barometer, which we call the People's uh, Survey, um, around, it's always over 100,000 people uh, in anywhere from 100 to 107 countries. And 
what we keep finding is that by asking the people whether in the last year they had, to, they had to pay a bribe, one out of four said they did. In the countries where corruption was more rampant, three out of four said they had to bribe in order to gain access to essential services. So it means that in many cases, if you don't have the money, you don't access the services, of course. And just one point which I always found interesting is that in countries where corruption is very high, what we see is only about 50% of the children finish primary school. Therefore, they're being robbed of their future, and at the same time, they become fodder. Not father, F-A, fodder, F-O, <laughs> for criminal gangs and for illicit trade who can offer them at least a bit of money. And so, you know, the, the, the whole issue, for example, of counterfeit medications, which is in all of our countries now, where people can buy online. Um, WHO indicated that about 700,000 people die every year just from counterfeit, just from malaria um, and tuberculosis. So when you multiply that by a whole lot of things. Uh, I think the other major issue with corruption is, of course, the loss of government income for development from tax evasion, transfer pricing, mispricing, bribery uh, in tax, licensing, permits, uh, land, as we were hearing this morning from the minister. But just on tax evasion, because that touches every country, yours and mine. Um, the assessment is that it's about uh, 3.1 a trillion per year, which is lost around the world for tax evasion. And that there's over about 21 trillion, as estimated, uh, held in um, tax havens. That was by the end of 2010, according to the Tax Justice Network. So money being siphoned out for, uh, that is not there for development, of course, creates major, major problem. And uh, we could say much more about that, but <clears throat> I'd like to just point uh, to a third area, which is the destabilization of countries uh, from illicit trade and other illicit financial flows, which of course leads to country fragility and conflict in many parts of the world, which are being fed from this uh, illicit trade. And of course in people, in drugs, uh, in arms, in counterfeit, um, and the, the danger here is that sometimes we don't really see what is happening as um, we get infiltration in our countries. And organized crime cartels create criminal patronage networks sustained by bribery and intimidation, uh, instituting, of course, parallel government structures in some countries or infiltrating those that are there. And, and that of, begins to bring that, that dangerous zone which can leave uh, countries to become very fragile. And of course, the, and it feeds terrorism uh, as well. So, and that corruption is really a common denominator in conflict countries. According to the World Bank, countries with weak governance and weak rule of law have 40% higher risk of civil war. And that's something to keep in mind, you know, that we need strong institutions, we need good governance, and we need strong. Now, coming back to, coming to the work of TI, um, I think we have worked as a movement to keep the corruption issue on national and international agendas. I'll come back to that. And to develop, uh, publish and use in our discussions tools, guidelines, programs um, that can be helpful uh, to advocate as a third area on specific issues and of course to increasingly mobilize society. I think for many years we worked at the national level and felt that okay that's where the action is taking place and then we realized of course that um, programs and services are delivered locally by local governments, so we introduce that aspect into our work of uh, dealing with how to help local government, governments, or govern, the governance of, not just the governments. The governments. Um, but then we realize that if the people 
in our countries are not involved and see themselves also as bringing solutions and as not tolerating corruption, then we could work at the top, but it doesn't always trickle down and that you need to work at the, the two levels with the people. Now, some examples in relation to these areas that I've mentioned. Um, in terms of keeping corruption on the national and international issues, of course, our Corruption Perception Index is the one that's best known. And I know when I was chair of TI, uh, the countries that were doing well, I didn't hear from. The countries that were at the bottom, I get sometimes a call from the president or the vice president saying, the methodology's got to be wrong. You know, it, it can't be. It can be true. We cannot be the last. <laughs> and uh, so the barometer I mentioned before. But what's also interesting is that a number of chapters uh, have instituted their own surveys, which can go deeper and more be more specific. So that also adds to the idea of uh, keeping the issue of corruption right on the agenda because it's easy for it to disappear. Um, then when I say we've been developed a number of tools and institutions, I'd like to, to go back to actually hearing the minister this morning and I was pleased to hear that um, the justice system and the rule of law and the role of law has to be preeminent and number one in what we're talking about. And this is what we have been. Right? And we have, uh, in this situation, you know, we, we, in our advocacy, of course, say that um, the judiciary has to be independent, impartial, professional, properly resourced, transparent in how it works uh, in order for it to be uh, working and to not have uh, impunity. Um, and of course the police, as in some countries, the police are at the top of those that are perceived to be, to be corrupt. And if the justice system, including the police, is not seen by the population as there to protect the population, then of course, uh, it can be a problem. So I think the, the, um, the police is a very important element of our society and I think that support to the police for it also to be independent and have the capacity in all its form to be able to do its work and uh, ensure that uh, we are all kept secure. One issue in relation to attorneys, investigators, and the police is the whole area of economic crime, which is very sophisticated. And I think that you know, one needs to make sure that these uh, institutions have the right capacity to be and are as smart, if not smarter, than those who commit economic crime. And to be able to detect it is not always uh, easy. In terms, I'd like to move to national state institutions uh, beyond the uh, justice system. And, and I think the three words that we keep repeating is transparency, integrity, and accountability. Uh, and in terms of transparency, to make sure that the people of the country have the information that they need to have. Because the government is there to manage the people's resources and to deliver the services that people need. And therefore, the people need to have the information. And I think where, where citizens are involved um, in identifying needs, in identifying issues, in working with governments in terms of coming with solutions, I think that there is a greater sense um, of empowerment to the people that they are not just victims or that they're not just witnesses, that they can be part of, of solving this. So the, the whole thing. What Transparency International has done, I'll just give one or two examples here. Many years ago, um, we developed what's called National Integrity System, which includes every aspect of governance in a country from the legislative branch to the executive, the judiciary, the public sector, uh, law enforcement, um, the electoral management, um, audit institutions, anti-corruption institutions, the media, political parties, and so on, including business. And this is a completely, um, um, a, a complete system 
uh, in terms of the governance of, of a country. And uh, it's been used quite extensively um, by our chapters in a number of countries. Um, and with the support of the government of those countries to do an assessment of the corruption situation in a country and an assessment of what's available um, to fix it or what are the gaps uh, in terms. And so this is one that today remains, after many years, uh, very uh, vital. Um, We've also, I was mentioning before, the local government, realizing that that was something that we had not tackled uh, seriously, uh, developed what we are calling guidelines for local governance integrity, which also mirrors, in a sense, the national system, but applied to the local governance. And um, we worked with, of course, uh, cities, uh, experts in the field in developing those, and now the question becomes how how can we all ensure that these are made fully available to individual cities? They don't need, you know, they can look online, but the promotion of that is one of the things that we advocate for. I'd like to make a point on procurement. Um, in many countries, 40 to 50%, if not more, of the revenues come from procurement. Um, of the, the um, of, I'm sorry, 40 to um, fifty percent um, can be lost to procurement, and this is seventy percent sometimes of uh, the of the budget of a country uh, is on procurement and construction. So if that doesn't work, first of all, you pay much more than you should, so you do less, and uh, you are creating a particular culture that over time you know, collusion becomes the solution as opposed to the problem. So what we do is, you know, we've got a lot of guidelines in this field and are promoting them and working, um, our chapters are working um, in the whole field of e-procurement and ensuring that there is a public commitment to zero tolerance when it comes to, uh, to um, procurement and construction and with transparency throughout the whole system, from uh, needs assessment, specif specifications, of course, bidders, selection criteria, right uh, to the final decision, and that, of course, the um, internet and, and the web is used to make sure that that's easily available. One of the things that we've added recently was the whole point of beneficial ownership. And what we're recommending to countries is that they should include in their specifications that no one should bid if they do not have, you know, the beneficial owners of their companies and their subsidiaries. Uh, otherwise, they're not welcome to bid. And to me, that's another way of getting at the whole issue of beneficial ownership on top of having public registers of beneficial owners and of course you need legislation which is very important and, and regulation but then it's got to be implemented and make sure that that register as you know is available uh, to the people. Um, some countries have used uh, an approach to assist on, on the whole field of, of procurement um, which is called social witness. Mexico has done that and they've been able to save huge amounts of money where for large contracts, you know, over a particular level, that uh, social witnesses, which are experts in the field of that, whatever contract is, uh, are um, appointed, and we can come back to how they're appointed because that's got to be ensured that they're independent uh, and so on, um, are then overseeing the contract for its life uh, and uh, that has, according to the Mexican authorities, been able to solve or to reduce a lot of the cost that was lost uh, to corruption in, in that field. Um, natural resources, um, again, you know, very high revenues from natural resources. So how does one make sure that the returns or the the taxes, the concession fees, 
uh, the royalties uh, are in keeping with the value of these, but also how do you ensure that there is full transparency in how these are paid uh, so that uh, the people know that the resources that are being taken out of their soil uh, is providing revenues to the country which they can benefit from. So the whole area of publishing what you pay, publishing the operations aspect um, by the natural uh, sector, natural resource sector to us is, is vital because otherwise uh, we have seen in some countries where when a mine closes, um, not one penny was paid in tax royalties or concession fees because of the kind of contract that was negotiated at the front end. And if that fails, for whatever reason, was it lack of capacity by the country? Was it bribery by the company? All of the above and more. Then, of course, it's a major, major uh, issue. Um, I'd just like to say a point or two on the what some of the chapters have been doing and the fact that an idea sometimes starts in a chapter and then is multiplied. Um, the uh, ALACs, you know, the Advocacy and Legal Assistance Centers, um, started in one country by a chapter and then ch other chapters have said, gee, this is a great idea. We'd like to do that too so that people who have an issue and who may not trust the agency of the government responsible for them to report that may feel more comfortable to do so in an institution like one of our national chapters. And I think this is, this is a, a very interesting idea. National Defense, um, our, our chapter in the UK, um, supported by the UK government, um, started uh, with NATO, um, a very substantial program of training for mid-level defense people who work in highly corrupt country and in fragile and conflict countries. And you know, this can be used by other, uh, um, other uh, defense um, departments in other parts of the world as well. So it's a, a, it's a one that is something which is, which is there. So um, I guess my, my point is that you know, a good idea can start in one chapter <clears throat> and then multiply. And I was very interested, Dion, in your point this morning about uh, the integrity in schools. And I'd like to have a special welcome for our young people. Because I feel that young people are not just our future, they are our present. And I have seen how young people at primary school level were able to influence their parents when there was a particular kind of curriculum. Uh, and I think that we think that they're just, well, it's, it, they're gonna learn something so that when they're adults, they're gonna behave differently. I think that they can be a very powerful force in, of nature to make a change. And, and young people, especially at primary level, um, are very persistent. And when they go home and they can, you know, promote what it is that they have learned. So. <laughs> The, one of the things I mentioned earlier was how important it was for Transparency International to work with other people, with other institutions, uh, with institutions of governments, of government, whether it's the Integrity Commission or uh, the Auditor General or many others, um, and with business at the table, because I think it's in doing that that we can, that certain things can be achieved which would not otherwise uh, be there. And um, I just want to say the impact uh, that uh, T you know, TTTI is, is working on with the government to me, the public sector is a very interesting example of what can be done. And of course, um, our ambassador, our high commission, commissioner from Canada talked about the conventions and Transparency International was very, uh, very active, especially but not only in the OECD convention, and then of course in the UN convention against uh, corruption, which we felt OECD was important, but then you needed to be at the international level, and, and that convention 
became um, very important. Uh, so the advocacy part of Transparency International uh, is one that uh, once we've done our homework together, then we can really move forward on that. And for example, uh, dealing with illicit financial flows. There's been a number of, of ways of doing that, but just with the G20, um, where we've been able to get a commitment from the G20 along with others, and the G20, I think, <clears throat> was very ripe for that, was to deal with the beneficial ownership, and countries are introducing legislation uh, in many parts of the world uh, to have registries of uh, who are the beneficial owners of companies, but trusts as well, not just the company. The multilateral exchange of information, working with the OECD, the multilateral, multilateral exchange of information on tax, it could take decades for a country like Trinidad and Tobago to work bilaterally with one country after another to try to develop a treaty um, to be able to exchange information on tax or any other illicit issues. So, you know, to us that was very important. And the other one was the due diligence of banks so that they know their clients because a lot of money circulates there. And a more recent area of interest has been on the facilitators of uh, illicit financial flows. That is accountants, lawyers, and uh, real estate in particular. It does take three to tango in this particular case. I know it's complicated to have three, but it does, does happen. And another point I'd just like to mention is the sustainable development goals. And again, we're together advocating that if goal, first of all, to have goal 16 on justice, uh, on anti-corruption, on transparency, and what we're saying is if goal 16 is not achieved, the other goals won't get there. The success will be very mitigated and may not be there at all. So working on that, I think with a lot of other institutions, I think is very, very important. I'd just like to say a few words about the business sector. They can be the perpetrators, but they can be the victims, and they can be the solutions providers as well. And I think what has become very well known is that if a company has been found to have bribed or colluded and they're in front of the courts, the big issue, of course, is not just how much money they will pay in fines and settlements, but the fact that um, their reputation is damaged for quite a period of time and their main focus instead of delivering on new products or current products is spent on, on focusing at being in all these court cases, especially for multinationals, uh, but also because of some of the legislation in a number of countries, those that have been found directly to be uh, the bribers um, are finding themselves in jail as well. So on one hand, you've got this particular situation, which businesses are learning from, but also a number of leaders have decided that um, it's good business to be clean. It's good business um, to have a strong anti-corruption program with good compliance capacity, with the leaders at the top making sure that they do not just say zero tolerance of corruption, but make it happen on a day-to-day -day basis with their teams uh, around and right to the front line. And that the front line knows that if they say no to extortion, they'll be protected at the top because they may not get that contract. But if they say yes, they'll know that they've got their hand in the meat grinder and the body will go through over a number of years, especially on big projects. And uh, so, I think that uh, it's important to work with business um, to uh, ensure that there are more and more of those leaders who want to see um, their sector um, 
to be one recognized as being clean. And we developed many, many years ago what's called the Business Principles for Integrity, which are led by some of the leaders of industry, supported by the Secretariat in Berlin. And like a, an SME version has been developed because there are many more small and medium-sized enterprises around the world than big businesses. And, and it's not easy for them to give themselves the tools that they need to be able to deal with corruption uh, with the, and to deal with extortion when they're providing um, services. My final point is on citizen involvement, as I mentioned earlier, with special attention to young people. Um, what some of our chapters have been able to do, um, first of all, I think that th this is something that we believe that um, one does not have to tolerate corruption and one has to be part of the solutions. But people need information. So access to information is vital. If they're going to be part of what's, what is needed to deal with the issue uh, of the culture of corruption, you need to have uh, the people involved. They need to work in groups. So civil society organizations are very important. And at the other end, the government has to be not just in a listening mode, but also to invite the people in, in working with them to find the kind of solutions that are so uh, important. So breaking free of corruption, I think really means working together to prevent corruption in the first place, but also to curb it because of what, you know, if with less corruption or with no corruption, then you have a more inclusive growth, you have more poverty reduction, you are able to maintain and build security, stability, peace, you're able to maximize the value of natural resources, you're able to protect a country's financial resources for its development, and that means that all revenues, budgets, disbursements are fully in the window available for everyone uh, to see and examine. And at the bottom line is that to be free of corruption means to build trust by the people in the leaders of state institutions at all levels and of course uh, in the business sector as well. So, Breaking free of corruption is a society project, and we all need to work together. And I'm looking forward uh, to hear the rest of the day and the wisdom that we're going to hear from many, many, many of you in this room. Thank you very much.